Hello and welcome to video three uh, for week one. In this video, I want to introduce two important types of series and also talk a little bit about algebraic manipulation of series. The first important type of series I want to introduce is the geometric series. So this is a series that has the form n equals zero to infinity, r to the n. And we call it r the common ratio. The idea that each term of the series you multiply by r again so if r is a half, then you multiply by half to get a quarter, multiply it by half to get an eighth, multiply by half to get a sixteenth. The Zeno's paradox series we used in the previous video was an example of a geometric series with common ratio one half. The geometric series converges whenever the common ratio is less than one in absolute value. That means that these numbers are going to grow small enough, since I take large powers of something less than one, it's going to get very small, that they in fact will converge. And we also know exactly what this converges to. This converges to the number 1 over 1 minus r, where r is the common ratio. So not only do we know convergence, we actually know the value, and that's relatively rare. We don't end up knowing the values a priori for many series. So this is a nice series to have access to, both to know its converges, convergence and to know its value. Another important type of series that we're going to use is the zeta series. Uh, this Greek letter here is the letter zeta. So these are referred to as zeta series. Many textbooks refer to these as p series, since p is the common exponent used. Um, but I prefer calling them zeta series. So this is a series of the form n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the p. Um, and this converges for all p greater or equal 1. Again, we need p to be a large number so that we have 1 over n to the p becoming small quickly enough that this converges. Um, so I say that this converges writing it less than infinity when p is greater or equal, greater than 1, not equal. If, this, if p is equal to 1, we get the harmonic series, which diverges. The value of this is less obvious than the geometric series. Um, we have no sort of nice expressions for the value of this. But this is, in fact, a well-known function. So it depends on p. And that's why I call this a zeta series, because this is a piece of the famous Riemann zeta function, which is important throughout mathematics for a variety of reasons. The Riemann zeta function is defined exactly by this infinite series, where p is the exponent of n, the index in the denominator. So that's where the zeta in the zeta series comes from. I said also I wanted to do a little bit on algebraic manipulations of series, so let me briefly go through these rules. Uh, we can pull constants out of series, we can push constants back in, so if c is a constant, I can write that constant inside or outside. That's basic factoring. If we have a constant that's common to a sum, we can pull it in and out of that sum. The same is true for infinite sums. Uh, sums are linear, they split up over um, subtraction and addition. So if I have uh, two sums, I can put them together into one. I have one sum with an addition in it or a subtraction in it, I can break it up into two. Uh, we have some nice manipulations in these last two lines for how to write sums. I'm allowed to pull out terms, so sometimes I only want the sigma notation to refer to a portion of the sum. So this says, well, m starts at zero, well, I get a0, then a1, then a2, and then I could start n at 3 to index the rest of them. So I could pull out these first three terms and just write them explicitly. And this is a useful thing to do in a number of circumstances. And this last line is called shifting. So I can shift the index, and sometimes it's convenient to shift the index. When I shift the index, it's a balancing act. Anything I do to the index outside, I have to do the opposite to the index inside so that I get the same sum. So that it balances out. So if I increase the index by one here, I have to decrease the index by one wherever it shows up in the term, and vice versa. If I in decrease the index by one here, I have to increase the index by one everywhere it shows in the term, so that the sum is preserved. Let me show you an example of shifting. So this is a situation where I have two sums that I would like to add together into one sum, but they start at different places. One starts at two and one starts at zero. I can't add them together unless they're in the same form, unless they have the same start. And these, these are infinite series, so they go to infinity, so they have the same end already. So I'm going to shift the first sum by going down to in the index and up to in the term. So anywhere I see n in the term, I replace it with n plus 2, and that allows me to start at n equals 0 instead of n equals 2. So that's a shift by 2 going down in the index, going up in the term. And now both of these start at zero, so now I can combine them with linearity into one sum. And from there I can go to common denominator, 
Uh, the common denominator here is going to be n plus 2 factorial. In order to get there, I have to multiply by n plus 1 and all the numbers less than n, which is n minus 1 factorial. So that's where I get this numerator. Then I go to common denominator, and then I can just write this as common denominator and get a single sum after I've shifted and done some factorial common denominator tricks. And this may be a much nicer way to work with this sum for a variety of reasons.